Lindblad Expeditions and National Geographic. We're so glad you could join our expedition photography webinar this evening. A few notes before we get started. Whether you selected phone audio or mic and speakers, we ask you not to change your settings during the webinar as it may disconnect you. If you do get disconnected for any reason, simply go back to your email and re-enter the webinar through the link provided. Tonight we are going to go through some slides of real photographs taken by our photographers, expedition leaders, and naturalists on our expeditions. Throughout the webinar you may have questions. We've dedicated 10 minutes at the end of the presentation for such questions. When you think of one, type it in the question box on the right-hand side of your screen and we'll do our best to get to all of them. I apologize ahead of time if we can't get to all of your questions. Also, we will be recording this webinar, so you'll receive an email in the next couple of days if you want to watch it again before your expedition or send it to a friend. Before I hand over the webinar to our special guest presenter, I'd like to tell you a bit about Lindblad's heritage. Lars Eric Lindblad pioneered expedition travel in the mid-1960s, bringing the first non-scientific travelers on expeditions to destinations such as Galapagos and Antarctica. His son and our founder, Sven Lindblad, has continued this legacy of expedition travel. And in 2004, we entered into a strategic partnership with National Geographic, a collaboration in exploration, discovery, and conservation to inspire our guests to explore and care about the planet. This partnership provides access to an innovative, knowledgeable expedition team of naturalists, researchers, scientists, and of course, photographers. So on that note, tonight I'm delighted to introduce our present presenter, who is both a National Geographic photographer and is also the director of Lindblad Expedition Photography Program Ralph Lee Hopkins. Ralph, are you ready to go? Yes, Carolyn, and thank you. And uh, good evening, everyone, and thanks for listening in wherever you are. Uh, it's great to be here this evening, uh, and this is quite a modern miracle of uh, technology because Carolyn's clicking the slides in New York, and I'm out in Montana. But um, our goal here tonight is to talk about our expedition photography program. Uh, because it's a really exciting program on board uh, the NAVIC Limblad Expedition's fleet of ships. And uh, it's a program that actually goes back to um, our, exp our, our, our uh, photo expedition program uh, that we started in about the year 2000. And, um, and now it's grown with our alliance with National Geographic into our expedition photography program. And the idea here is to, well, everyone travels with a camera. And it doesn't matter what kind of camera you arrive with. I mean, it can be your iPhone. It can be your, your point and shoot, the camera that you always have with you, uh, which we love to call Aim and Create. Uh, we adopted that term on board. I think it was Michael Nolan and C.T. Tickner that came up with that one. Um, and, and right on up to you know, the more serious photographers. So it doesn't matter what camera uh, you have. Um, it's about having the interest and the desire, not only to travel, because travel and photography goes go together, but to be inquisitive, to learn, and to have patience, and to observe in, in a different way. And that's really what photography can help you do. So it's one of these elective things that we do on board, and it's great because spouses um, who aren't into photography or partners who aren't into photography can go out on the natural history walks, they can go kayaking, meanwhile the photographers might be out on a photo walk somewhere. So going on to um, the three components now of the expedition photography program. Um, and this is important to understand because on all of our ships, no matter what trip you have booked, there's going to be what we call the Lindblad National Geographic Certified Photo Instructor. And I've worked with other National Geographic photographers to certify our naturalists who are already expert naturalists in their field and they're also avid photographers. So now they have become teachers out on the ships. So every one of our trips, no matter what the designation on all the ships, including our charter ships, will have the certified photo instructor. But very importantly now, this is an important distinction, when we move on to the Explorer and the Orion, every trip on the Explorer and our new ship, the Orion, and we'll talk more about this ship later in the broadcast, um, 
not only has the certified photo instructor, but also has a bona fide National Geographic photographer or someone who is working within the National Geographic photography realm, which is you know a pretty big realm on some level. So these, these folks have tales from the field, they're doing a lot of things with National Geographic, and they bring that presence of National Geographic out to our ships because uh, everything out on board the ships is about being in the moment, learning and taking advantage of or, or putting our best foot forward in the situations that we have. So we really want to max maximize our viewing opportunities and what better way to do that is alongside these amazing people who have traveled the globe. The third style of voyage, so now you know that on every trip we have the, the photo instructor. On the Orion and the Explorer we have both the photo instructor and the National Geographic photographer. And then we notch it up a level and it's typically on the seabird sea line on the smaller ships in the fleet or down in Galapagos we have trips that are called photo expeditions and these are targeted and marketed as photo expeditions for people who have a little bit more interest and want to be a little bit pardon the pun more focused on their photography during the trip so we have more talk I mean all of our, our trips have introductory lectures, breakout session, one-on-one -on -one sessions, kind of mock assignments, but the photo expeditions kind of take them to a different level with our photo instructors, and sometimes you'll have two or three or even four photo instructors on these trips along with a National Geographic photographer. So that's the outline of the program. So going back to, I mean, maybe you've already booked your trip, uh, and if it's on the Orion or the Explorer, you know that there'll be a National Geographic photographer there. Um, so back to these certified photo instructors, every ship in the fleet, these people are already skilled naturalists, and that's really what takes, you know, you, when you think about, especially now, digital photography, there's really three components to making good photographs. One is understanding your camera, and so we hope before you come on a trip that you'll practice with your new camera. We can help you with tips and tricks, but you really need to be familiar with, with whatever camera you choose. Then, once you're there, it's about knowing your camera enough so that you can be in the moment and think about light and composition. And this is where the certified photo instructors and the, Nat and the National Geographic photographers can help you. They can give you tips on uh, effective ways of using the light or at times when you know you need to be more patient. So getting this better understanding of your camera um, is important, but also then taking in the natural history information and so that you can anticipate. So being with the, the, the photo instructors, being with the National Geographic photographer, you can see Kim Hecox down on the ground here giving instruction how to shoot these, these uh, flowers in, in the Arctic. There's Michael Melford, there's Flip Nicklin face-to-face -face with a, with a uh, elephant seal down in South Georgia. So all this hands-on goes with the talks on board the ship, we have presentation breakouts, we do slideshows, sometimes on the longer trips we'll even do critiques of the guest work. We put together a guest slideshow of, of all the photos that have taken. We have people submit photos, and we, we celebrate on the last evening of the trip with a slideshow. So we've got these great things happening. And then, on, of course, on our photo expeditions, these are the trips that um, are more targeted towards the people have, who have more of an interest in photography. But again, if one partner isn't interested in the photo side, there's always natural history walks, and there's bing walks, and there's other things that are happening. So it's always a very balanced, even on a photo expedition, we do have talks about natural history. And again, you're, you're side by side with the experts in the field and uh, during the trip. Now, t talking a little bit about um, the photo opportunities. I mean, we're you know it's it's hard to give a talk like this because we're talking about such diverse geographies. Of course, the giant tortoise in the upper left-hand corner that's from the Galapagos. Uh, Galapagos will spoil you. Um, you can get close to the wildlife. The wildlife. It's not that they're tame, but they show no fear. Um, the birds in the upper right-hand corner. The uh, Hermans gulls. Uh, we go to some of the best places in Baja California on our trips throughout the season, from December on into April. Of course, our ships go from pole to pole, so you're seeing polar bears. If you've been following what's been going on up in Baffin Island this summer, we found another hot spot for wildlife in the Arctic. So not only do we go you know, to Svalbard, but we're now over in Greenland, Iceland, and up into the Northwest Passage and the Canadian Arctic, which is really exciting. So the photo opportunities uh, across the fleet and, ac and throughout the year are just amazing um, in these geographies from pole to pole. And um, we have, of course, with Limblad and National Geographic, we have some of the most experienced, not only naturalists, but also officers and crew that um, take us to these amazing places on 
some of the best expedition ships afloat. From the Arctic to the Antarctic, Galapagos, Baja, California, Southeast Alaska, and now, of course, we're moving into Indonesia. We've been doing our, our Europe trips as well for a long time. We've got some trips in the Mediterranean, so we're really all over the globe, and, and that is very, very exciting. So talking about a place that I've been looking to return to, the South Pacific, um, how exciting now that we have our newest ship in the fleet, the National Geographic Orion. Uh, that will be sailing 11 different itineraries throughout the South Pacific to Australia, Borneo, and Indonesia, and we'll also visit uh, the Antarctic. But the South Pacific, and you're going to need to think about having a camera that you can take underwater. Uh, there's many of these point and shoots now that are all weather that you can take underwater. You can get some of the, the other smaller cameras and you get housings for them. Of course, you can get, spend a lot of money and get housings for your big camera, but you want at least um, and aim and create point and shoot camera to take underwater because you'll be visiting some of the best snorkeling and diving locations on the planet, including the Great Barrier Reef in Australia on some of these itineraries. Um, so the South Pacific is very exciting. We ha had the Explorer there, um, I think it was back in 2008, 2009. So it's very exciting to get, to get um, uh, back into these geographies. Um, moving on to the Antarctic. Of course, it's the Arctic season right now, so our ship is in, in the north, and down in the Antarctic, it's in our North American winter season, and I don't know where folks are listening in from, but you know, we're talking about um, oh, getting down to South Georgia in November and the Falkland Islands, and then heading on down to the Antarctic Peninsula by mid to late November and into December. So we're getting down there when there's still lots of pack ice. Uh, you can see in the upper left-hand corner of that photo, there are, we literally parked the ship in the pack ice, test the ice, and we're out there walking and photographing the ship, uh, photographing each other. I mean, it's really quite something. Sometimes you have penguins come walking by when you're out on the pack ice and the ship is just parked there. That usually happens early season. There's killer whales, humpback whales, of course, the penguins, and everyone thinks they come for the penguins, but it's really the ice and the scale of the Antarctic scenery that, that steals the show. Um, of course, the Explorer is there all season, but the Orion will also be making some trips down um, and visiting Arctic, or excuse me, the Antarctic Peninsula as well as South Georgia uh, and the Falklands. So very, very exciting opportunities to, to go down to Antarctica. The big question that everyone has, um, you know, talking about photographically, I mean, you do need some longer lenses, but people worry more about the crossings, and the crossings, I tend to, I mean, I can, I can get seasick from time to time if it's rough, but once you're down there, the crossing uh, takes about a day, and then it calms down. Uh, you're in protected waters, you're in the ice, so I just take the medication and, and, uh, and get there. Um, so don't worry. Not Fearing the crossing, I guess is what I'm saying, is not a good reason not to go to Antarctica. Uh, because it's such an amazing place, and it can be flat calm going across, so you just never know. Uh, but it's one of the most exciting destinations uh, on the planet, both from the ice point of view, the wildlife point of view, and it's it's all wilderness. Um, there's only some scientific bases there, um, so it's it's one of the most pristine wilderness areas that you can you can visit on the planet, and it's managed that way for the world. Jumping up to the north, um, with the the next slide to the Arctic. Um, this is where I just got back from, trips from Iceland. Of course, the ship's been in Svalbard uh, since June. We're talking about the Explorer now. We circumnavigated Iceland, then went to Greenland and up into the Canadian Arctic. Um, and you know, we've been hearing a lot in the news about climate change and, and what's happening with the ice. And at least from our observations, that's true. The glaciers are receding. Uh, the pack ice is opening up, and we're going to be attempting the Northwest Passage, two very exciting itineraries, one north, I guess westbound, one back eastbound next uh, summer uh, to the Arctic. Um, of course, the pinnacle species, the, the holy grail up there is the polar bear, um, and it's one of my favorite animals to see out on the ice and to, to observe. And remember, a lot about photography is really... Uh, having a new way of seeing, um, being patient. You know, not only are we seeing the bear and, and getting the close-up shots, but showing the bear in its environment, showing it with the two cubs walking away. I mean, you could, many times you can zoom in, but seeing the icy environment, I mean, that's really what it's about. Uh, of course, in the Arctic, you've got uh, 
hundreds of thousands of seabirds. You don't have a lot of diversity in seabirds, but we go to some amazing seabird cliffs. There's also the seals and the walruses. Uh, you can see a, a mother walrus here, cow calf, with its with its calf, its youngster. Excuse me. And so the Arctic. Uh, you also have the the tundra. Now we kayak in the icebergs. Of course, you want to stay away from the big ones. We go ashore and we explore the Arctic tundra for photos of wildflowers. So. Um, you know the Antarctic is 99% ice, and we land where there's no land. And, and when you, by the time you get up to the Arctic, you're talking 70, 80% covered in ice. The places that we go, so you see many more plants. Of course, they're all very small, the the tundra species. Um, so that's really our cold weather, the coldest weather environments. And we're not talking super cold either. That's the other question we always get: How cold is cold? And I'll tell you one thing, it's warmer than Chicago and Minnesota in the winter when we go up to these places. It's, it's usually in the 30s. You want to dress in layers like you're going skiing. Um, we, you know, we wear our boots so our feet are warm and, and we wear thick socks. And, and um, it's really, it, the temperature's going to be even up into the 40s and then in the 50s at times. <coughs> so, that's, so that's the Arctic. Um, Heading now along the equator to another one of, and, and people are always asking, what's your favorite destination? And uh, I try not to have people start with us on a trip to Galapagos because it just sets the bar so high. Uh, these amazing animals, all these endemic species, of course, you're probably all familiar with the Charles Darwin story and, and how Galapagos, the animals there have evolved to be their own species from Lonesome George and the giant tortoises to the the only marine iguanas uh, in the world that, that swim and eat algae. Of course, the one that's the yellow one here in the lower left-hand corner, that's a land iguana, so you have the big land iguanas, even though the Sally Lightfoot crabs don't run away from you. Um, there's just something magic about the Galapagos. And of course, for a photographer or for anyone interested in natural history and wilderness, uh, a visit to the Galapagos will literally change your life being eye to eye with blue-footed boobies doing their dances um, and, and many of the other birds, the finches just landing at your feet, um, the shorebirds, the, you know, even the, you know, the great blue herons just sit there and look at you. Um, so for a photographer, there's no limit there in subject matter and then it's all about pacing ourselves to give you time to shoot and especially on our photo expeditions and this, I can't emphasize this enough, if you're thinking about going to the Galapagos, and you consider yourself a slightly, well, I guess, a serious photographer or, or have an above average interest, let's say, and you really want to learn more and spend time with the craft, in the Galapagos, it's best to book a photo expedition there. Of course, every trip has our certified photo instructors. So there's always some photo instruction, but the, the trips are paced a little differently. So check out a photo expedition if you're going to go to the Galapagos and you want to have a little more time and, and spend uh, a little more time with the photography. Um, but I can't say enough about the Galapagos. I was there in June, and it's also great for families. Alaska. Um, well, this is like you know the greatest hits of of travel. What we're talking about, uh, Southeast Alaska. Our ships, the Seabird and Sea Lion, National Geographic Seabird and Sea Lion, have been up there this season now. What? It's August, so they've been up there since May, and they've just. If you've checked out our daily expedition reports uh, on our website, they've been having amazing weather amazing wildlife. Of course, the glaciers are there, the eagles are there. They even had northern lights they were photographing from the bow of the ship. I mean, they've just had it all. Um, in Alaska, we use the ship as a platform for photography. We also have our zodiacs, of course, but we cruise with the ship. We cruise through the ice. <coughs> we cruise in front of the glaciers. Um, we go into Glacier Bay, we pick up a ranger and we do this special tour around Glacier Bay looking all at, at the sights and listening to the sounds and waiting for glaciers to calve. Uh, we get out on our zodiacs to get up close, uh, not only to the bears on shore, but also you know the sea otters. There's places where we find sea otters and, and stellar sea lions where we can observe them from our zodiacs. Um, and of course the, some of the stars there, in addition to the killer whales or orca whales in southeast Alaska, are the humpbacks. And of course, you know, most of you know that the humpbacks in Alaska, they travel from Hawaii where they're, where they're um, you know, mating and having their young and, and, and then they, they migrate back to Alaska to feed all summer. So many times, if we're very lucky, you can luck into seeing their feeding behavior, which is this 
cooperative bubble net feeding where 8, 10, 12 whales might get together, dive down, one whale releases the bubble net, and then they all come up with their mouths agape at one time. And uh, that's a pretty exciting thing to see in the world. And there's very few places in the world where, where whales do that kind of feeding. But in southeast Alaska, we've had very good luck finding and seeing that kind of behavior. So for trees and glaciers and hikes in the woods and bonding with your rubber boots out on the trail and the muskegs, um, for seeing bears, whales, otters, and of course the glaciers calving, uh, one of the best places in the world is where we go, and that is southeast Alaska. Uh, okay, so now coming to yet another uh, favorite destination, and this one will surprise you if you have not traveled yet to Baja, California, and it doesn't matter if you're a photographer or not, uh, we're talking only a couple hour flight from Southern California, get down to La Paz or, or San Jose del Cabo, and then transfer to our ships, and the seabird spends the entire season in Baja, California, and then the sea lion comes in late in the season for a couple of trips in late March, early April. Uh, Baja, California is, and I can say this, um, probably the best place in the world to see whales and dolphins on a daily basis. And it's this, just not one species of whales. You're seeing here the, uh, the humpback in the upper right-hand corner. We talked about humpbacks in, in Alaska, and you can see them all over the world. They're there in Baja, California, and they're acrobatic as well. But there's the blue whales, the largest whale on the planet, perhaps the largest mammal that's ever lived on the planet. There's fin whales, sperm whales, pilot whales, um, you name it. They are, they are there in the, Baja, in the Baja California, and we spend time looking for them. We spend time cruising for them, as well as landing on the remote desert islands. All the islands in Baja California are a UNESCO World Heritage Site, same designation for the Galapagos. So Baja and Galapagos, even though they're in much different geographies, they share a lot of the similar traits and, and levels of protection, and even in terms of their endemic species. Uh, the lower right-hand corner here, that's a spiny-tailed iguana on a cardone cactus. Both of those species, the cactus N and the, uh, uh, the lizard there, are endemic species to Baja California. So we spend a lot of time landing on remote islands. There's good snorkeling. Of course, there's the California sea lions. Um, so Baja, I, I can't say enough about it. The ship, especially the seabird, is there um, from December on up into April. I'll be on board next March, April. So even the what people consider the late season trips are April trips. Yes, the gray whales, and I didn't even mention the friendly gray whales on the Pacific Coast when we go into the lagoons. Um, you know about their their their. Um, migration from the Bering Sea and the Arctic down to Baja California where they again mate and give birth to their calves but those whales, those gray whales are the superstars. They come up and, and they're interested in us. They're interested in getting close to us and sometimes they get very close to our boats. Now in late March when they start heading north there are still whales lingering uh, in San Ignacio Lagoon, and so the ships, both of our ships will be going up there in late March, early April to San Ignacio Lagoon on the Pacific Coast, and then um, coming around back into the Gulf. Now, even though it's not going to be a gray whale trip, the April trips, the, the, it's an amazing um, adventure going looking for blue whales, sperm whales, fin whales, and getting far up into the Gulf, like the Isla Rasa, the bird reserve where all the elegant turns and human skulls are. So uh, it's really one of the most productive seas uh, on the planet. That is Baja California. And um, there's very few ships traveling there. And of course, we are there all season long. So that's Baja California. Um, and then to, to round it out, I guess, in our warm weather destinations, um, the sea lion spends December through what, early March in Costa Rica and Panama. So this, this itinerary goes back and forth, starting in Costa Rica, then the ship was down to Panama and through the Panama Canal, and then reverses the itinerary. And it includes, if you choose to, to take the land extensions, you can make it a two-week adventure where you spend time on the ship and then you go up to some of the the reserves on land on a, on a week long extension. Um, you know, I'm mostly a naturalist. I'm mostly a wildlife photographer. Um, I love landscape photography, 
but it surprises me. The Panama Canal and the history of the Panama Canal and photographing the Panama Canal, sometimes we even make night transits, which are, which are exciting, um, is really thrilling. It really surprised me the first time, and I've probably been through now 50 times, but the Panama Canal is always, always interesting. And if you haven't been through it, I mean, it's one of those things on your bucket list. And it's a great combination then of the history of the Panama Canal and all that Central American history uh, combined with the wildlife, good snorkeling, and if you're a bird lover, uh, some of the best birding, especially for the tropical species, uh, you're seeing a, a chestnut mandible toucan there in the upper left-hand corner, and of course the monkeys. Uh, Manuel Antonio National Park, where we visit, uh, is one of the best parks anywhere in Central America for seeing and photographing uh, and being with the wildlife, and we usually make a very early landing there in, in, in the morning. So that's Costa Rica and Panama. Um, exciting times there um, from December on up into March. So let's talk a little bit more about, about the fleet, especially because uh, we've added a new ship, and um, which is very exciting. And I haven't even seen her yet or been aboard the National Geographic Orion. Um, you know, we say the Explorer is the best expedition ship afloat. And she is because she's ice strengthened and so spacious and comfortable. And it looks like we found another ship that, uh, even though it takes a few less passengers, 102 guests in 53 cabins, is just as spacious. Gives that feeling, that big, you know, that private yacht feeling. Uh, some some of the cabins, some of the rooms have balconies, and it's just from everything I hear and see online, is just a beautiful ship and really really tailored to what we do. There's going to be diving on board. Um, we're going to be in tropical tropical waters. Um, we, you know, so we've got the zodiacs. We're all set up for snorkeling. And, um, but the amazing thing about the Orion is, since she's stabilized and has an ice class hull, she's a full you know, ice class vessel, just like the Explorer. Uh, she'll also be venturing down into some of the exciting uh, Antarctic waters. So we're all excited about her. Um, I'll be on um, next June. I'm very excited about going up to uh, the Kimberley region of Australia. Of course, um, I mean, I cut my teeth on the seabird sea lion. I've been working with Lindlaff for 24 years, starting out as a geologist on up through expedition leading. And here you can see this is a, an image I, I made in uh, Misty Fjords National Park. And it kind of shows everything that we do. There's the Zodiac heading out for exploring. Meanwhile, we have some guests staying back on board as the ship navigates the narrow waterway, using the ship as a platform for observing and for photography. So it's very exciting how we use our ships. Uh, here's the National Geographic Explorer nosing up to uh, the ice cap in uh, Svalbard, in Northeast land in Svalbard. So we can use the ship, again, for photography. It's not all about always getting off and being on land because there's places where you, it's best to be photographing from, from the ship. Uh, here are chin-strap penguins. Uh, this, is, this is down in the Antarctic now, uh, on shore with the icebergs stranded on shore with the ship in the background. Um, you'll never work or travel with a company that gets the ships closer to shore. We chart our own areas and we ride the anchor such that the captain literally gives us the shortest zodiac cruise to shore. And zodiacs are the key to our operation. Um, here you're seeing uh, stellar sea lion in southeast Alaska uh, with the guests out. You can see how w we use the boats for photography. If, if something is on your side of the boat, you kneel down, and the others can stand up and, and get a good view. So we're always, uh, you know, it's one thing to go out cruising in a boat. It's another thing to go out cruising for composition, and that's what we do with our expedition photography. Our drivers know how to put you in the best spots. But there's times when you want to just take your all-weather all camera or no camera at all and just paddle around and listen to the sights and sounds in our kayak fleet. Um, you know, there's, especially once you've been introduced to an area and now you don't have the natural, you, although you hear us kind of in the back of your head to be safe and stay away from the icebergs, but it's just you out there having that in-the-moment experience uh, here with Gentoo penguins now porpoising by. Uh, your kayak, and what could be more thrilling than that? So we use kayaks all over the globe, from the Galapagos to the Arctic to the Antarctic, um, and we'll even use them in the Amazon on, on the charter ships, so um, on the Delphin II. 
So if you have the opportunity to get out on a kayak, and, and even if you haven't done it before, we can teach you how to do that. Um, but I would say our hallmark now, when you think about the expedition photography program or photography in general, it's traveling with like-minded people, um, celebrating each other's successes, <laughs> and, and then looking at our images. You know, here you have people gathered uh, in, in the chart room on the Explorer, probably after either a polar bear event or, or some exciting event, you know, sharing their images. Did you get the shot? Um, so there's a lot of learning that goes on board, a lot of one-on-one. -on -one. And, and a lot of times, people with the same models of cameras will sit down together and exchange information. Uh, now, most people, or a lot of our, our guests, travel with small small laptops, and they back up their images to external hard drives, and that's the way they travel. But also on board the ships, um, what we have are what we call our Mac photo kiosk. We have a workstation where you can put your card in, transfer images to a storage device of some sort. Um, and then clean your cards or not, or just you know label them in such a way that you can find them later um, in your transfer and backup process. So we do have a workstation available to you. It's 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 the best way to go is is to have your own laptop. But if you don't want to carry your laptop, you can get by just by having you know taking enough cards to store your photos, maybe having a backup drive that you can transfer and backup your photos to. But of course, looking at them, you know, at least every other day, so you can see if you're having any problems, see how you're doing, and use this beautiful machine. Because at the end of the trip, we we ask guests to contribute three to five pictures to the guest slideshow, and on the last night of the voyage, um, we share these together, and that slideshow is something that you can take home. Um, so here's the the lounge on the Explorer, and and we get together for recaps, slideshows, and all these presentations. Um, and we have some geared towards photography on all of our, our expeditions. But we're also talking about the natural history. We're talking about the birds and the history in these places. And it's amazing. The more you know, you know you're, into, you're interested in photography and you're learning more about your cameras. But the more you learn about a destination and what's special about it, the more you will see to photograph. So learning about the natural history and the history of a place um, can help you in your quest to make more meaningful pictures on your vacation, because what we are hoping by empowering you, empowering all our guests with their photography, whether it's just shooting still photos with their iPhone or shooting short video clips with an iPhone, on up to the point and shoot aim and creates, and on up to the digital SLRs, it's really about you telling your story of your trip. And so we're hoping that all of our guests do that and, and share this this really this gift of travel that that you're giving yourself and that. And, and what we pride ourselves on. Because we have some of the best staff, some of the best photographers out there with you, and we're going to these great places. Amazing things are happening on our ships every day uh, somewhere in the world. And, and now our guests are a part of that, of course, because we're, we're out there for you, we're out there to help you, we're out there to try to prepare you for these experiences. And, and what, a, what a thrill if you can make a good photograph along the way, or 30 or 50 good photographs that you can share with, with your family. We also have a video chronicler on the ship, so I know a lot of guests are interested in video, but video, boy, it's a leap to do the work to make a film. Well, we have these young kids that make videos of each one of our trips, and, and for a small fee, you can take these videos home, but these are professionally made, complete with mu music, edited down, with quotes from naturalists and guests, um, usually 30 to 60 minutes long. And this will include footage for our, from our undersea specialists. We have a lot of technology on our ships, from uh, remotely operated submarines, to diving in cold water, to underwater video cams and splash cams. And we're using this, this technology to bring back the undersea world to our guests. And um, this material also is included in the video chronicle that is available, available to you. Uh, to take home. So that's a very exciting part about what we do. Um, and it's not only the staff, it's right on down to the crew. Um, our captains are extremely experienced and fantastic about the natural world and getting our ships in good places. Um, I knew I had the dream job when the captain called me on the radio and said, hey Ralph, we have whales, which side do you want the light on? Um, so we think about that right now to the captain and the officers driving the ships. 
or the Ponga drivers, the Zodiac drivers in Galapagos, they're thinking about photography. Uh, we want it to be comfortable, we want it to be safe, and it really is a seamless, seamless operation. Um, we're really like a fan of all the different ships. Um, we come and we go and we get together in different combinations, but we have, all are excited to be there. I've been doing it, what, 24 years now, and many of the people I work with um, have been doing it, if not one decade, two decades. So um, we have a great time out there on the ships. And I, I really hope you'll join us. And I think I'll turn it back over to Carolyn at this point, and then we'll answer some questions at the end. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Ralph. So just to pick, off, pick up where Ralph left off, um, to talk a little bit more about our offerings on the ship, we provide daily stretching and a range of wellness and massage treatments aboard. We source local food as much as possible, adding to our sustainable culture. And many people often ask us, why is Lindblad Expedition such a great value? Well, the best part is you can join without a dollar in your pocket and you can have an amazing adventure. And here is just a list of some of the things that the expedition includes, of course, all the accommodations, um, meals aboard the ship, activities in shore excursions, transfers to and from group flight. And you can all feel free to learn more. Uh, visit our site, expeditions.com. Keep an eye out for our special offers. You can order a brochure here. And you can check out what a trip is really like, as Ralph mentioned earlier, through our daily expedition reports. And you can sign up to get those. And just as a reminder, we'll be sending an email in the next few days with a link to this webinar, so you can watch it again on our website, or you can feel free to browse previously recorded webinars. And that's at expeditions.com slash webinars. So that brings us to the end of our presentation. Um, thank you for joining us tonight. A big thank you to our presenter, Ralph Lee Hopkins, for his enthusiasm and insight. I definitely want to go on a trip now, all of them, in fact. So we have a few minutes to devote to questions. And there have been several that have come in. So uh, the first one, Ralph, that uh, several people have asked about is tripods. People want to know if there are tripods available on board. Um, and if there are not, um, are they recommended? What do you suggest? <laughs> Oh, uh, always a great question, the tripod question, and boy, that would be an idea to have tripods on board. We'll have to look into that, but no, we don't have uh, tripods on board because not everyone uh, uses a tripod. Um, I guess my standard answer for folks who are cons trying to consider whether they should bring a tripod or not, of course it depends on the destination. Um, so just in general, if you're a, someone who, in your photography, when you go out to photograph, you always have a tripod and you work on a tripod and you're familiar with your tripod and you don't mind carrying your tripod, which means you have a light enough tripod that it straps onto your backpack and it's always available, then by all means bring your tripod. Um, just don't carry it on the plane, pack it and wrap it in, in your duffel somewhere and, and have it shipped with your, your checked luggage. Um, but don't have one of our expeditions be the first trip where you've ever tried to use a tripod. Um, you can get away with using a monopod. Um, just a single leg that your camera sticks to and that can uh, or attaches to um, and that can help a monopod can help you as a walking stick but it also helps stabilize your camera but most importantly and this is really where the tripod question comes to it's not only stabilizing your camera but it's letting you be more patient because when you're in Galapagos and you're looking at the animals and they're doing behaviors and you're waiting for a certain behavior to happen can you really hold your camera up to your eye, and while I'm talking, I'm doing this, I don't know why I'm doing that, uh, and, and wait long enough. I have a hard time keeping my camera held up in that position, but when you're on a monopod, it's supported. You can just look over the top of it, and you're more patient. Um, so you should have some type of camera stabilizing unit, and I really recommend monopods, but if you do use a tripod and you have a lightweight tripod, don't hesitate to bring it on any of the trips, because they're often useful as you know, just on deck of the ship, just to stabilize your camera for the reasons I just mentioned. Long answer, but it's it's critical. It's a, it's a good question. So actually, along with that, can you talk a little bit about vibration on deck? Um, is there any shutter speed that you should be considering, or is it a factor when you're taking photos? Yeah, that's a good concern. Um, 
you know, we'll talk about the, the bigger ships, I mean, or being on the ship, not a Zodiac to start. Um, the vibration really isn't that much of a factor. Um, the ships are very stable. Um, I wouldn't lay your camera right on the rail without maybe a bean bag. But the best way now um, to shoot from the ship, and this has changed when we've switched from film to digital because we can elevate our ISO and shoot at faster shutter speeds, and that was part of the question. So when I'm on a moving platform, I always recommend to people to shoot at about a thousandth of a second, so a faster shutter speed. Um, how do you get a thousandth of a second if it's in dim light? Well, you have to raise your ISO. If you're always shooting at 400, you need to go to 800 or maybe even 1600. Um, so hand-holding um, is the best way to remove vibration, but if you're using a monopod, you can just put it on your toe, on your foot, and that'll help dampen it. And most of the newer cameras, and this is one of the main reasons to upgrade your lenses, is for the autofocus and also the vibration reduction that is built into these lenses. Some camera systems have it in the camera. But vibration reduction, shooting at a faster shutter speed, um, and having good posture with your camera will all help get you sharp pictures in a situation. Because sometimes it's not just the vibration, it's the motion of the ship. And the waves go up a little bit and down, and, and just times where you need faster shutter speed. And these are the types of things we talk about on board in our breakout sessions. Good question. That's great. Thanks, Rob. We also have a bunch of folks here that are traveling on Galapagos trips, and there are uh, two questions that are related. One is, should people bring special waterproof cameras, or should they just buy a special casing? Can you can you talk about that for underwater photos? Well, yeah. The question: Do you buy a camera that can just go underwater, or do you buy a casing? Um, it depends on the camera that you have, and if you're going out to purchase one, that's the choice that you will want to make. Um, because each camera, each type of camera has has more advantages, or or there's the advantages and disadvantages. One being cost, of course. Um, but for you know the standard shooter, just trying to you know capture the experience of being with the the sea lions and the fish and the Galapagos and the turtles, having um, one of the whether it's Canon, Nikon, or Olympus, the all weather underwater cameras are great because then you can wear, use them in the kayak, you can go underwater with them. They're great for giving to the kids if you're traveling with your kids because they're virtually indestructible. Um, so the camera itself is waterproof. So that's probably the easiest solution. Um, the next level up then is to get a little bit more sophisticated of the point and shoot or super zoom varieties. Maybe like the Canon G15, Nikon has, I can't even remember all the numbers anymore. I don't know if it's the 7700 cool picks. Um, many of these smaller cameras will have the housings that you can buy, but now the camera is going to be $400 and then the housing sometimes is $200. So you can see you're probably already twice as much as the previous alternative. So um, you can research that, you can call or, or really research that on the B&H uh, photo site because um, they have some of the, you know, the best camera systems available. That's the biggest superstore in the world. And if you call them, they'll be more than happy to, to help you. Um, but certainly have an underwater camera. Um, just as an aside, we had a young man, 14 years old, who got one of the safe skin or, or um, there's different um, iPhone or, or smartphone underwater housings for your phone. And he was making great pictures with this iPhone. So it's not about the camera, but have something that can take underwater in Galapagos for sure. Thanks. So switching to a different geography, there are also several folks who are going on the Antarctica trips, and they are asking questions about shooting in snow and ice conditions and if there are special filters needed and anything that they should be focusing on prior to their trip. All right, for Antarctica, um, well, I mean, this goes across the board. You always want to be able to protect your gear. The number one concern before you even get to shooting is protecting your gear in wet landings. And you can have very wet landings, very splashy landings. Most of the landings, if you just have a good backpack with a rain cover that gets your gear ashore, and I'm, I'm harping on this a little bit at the beginning here because I always see people with just their camera around their neck or stuck in their jacket, and that's not the best way to protect your gear. Having that backpack 
or some kind of belt pack with a rain cover or put it in a garbage bag, gets it to shore. Um, well, once you're on shore or shooting from the Zodiac in good conditions, um, the, you, the cold is not a problem. You don't want to go from a really warm cabin outdoors. You want to let your gear uh, equilibrate to the surroundings, just like in, in Costa Rica or Panama. You don't want to go from the the hot heat or the air, cool air conditioning board out into the hot humid. You want to leave your cameras outdoors, so you want to be careful of that. Um, the many of us use the rain sleeves for splashes. Uh, now we ha we're holding our cameras. It might be snowing. It might be, you know, misting. I recommend having your sunshade, even though it may not be sunny. Have the sunshade for your lens because that offers protection from mist and dust and also protects the end of your lens, and then have one of these rain sleeves. They're like two for 15 bucks. We sell them on board that fits over your camera so you can shoot when it's raining. And always have something to wipe your lens with. Now, as far as the conditions, there's no special filters needed. It's all about exposure. Your camera tries to make what is bright and white middle gray. So you purposely want to overexpose or add light to light and overexpose what is snow and ice or going the other way, underexpose or darken down what is dark. So you, you learn how the camera sees the world and it, it always tries to make everything middle gray. And it's not a filtration thing, it's, it's an exposure thing. But I'm on board in our breakout sessions about adding light to light and purposely overexposing the snow and icy scenes. And many of the cameras it's called the snow setting or the beach setting. Um, so we'll talk about that. So there are tricks so to keep the snow white so that your camera's not underexposing. Excellent question. Great. Now, we've been Long talking answer. a lot about uh, <laughs> serious cameras, but there, there have been a few questions uh, along the lines of, if I bring a little digital camera or just my smartphone, will I be laughed at on deck? <laughs> you will be the envy of everyone. And the reason is, <laughs> again, it's not about the camera. And I always have my iPhone with me because making panoramics with the iPhone, um, they're always fun and they're and they're and and it's best it's the easiest with with an iPhone. Um, but we often see because people with the smaller cameras, the aiming creates or their smartphones, they're always ready. They always have their camera ready. They're not worried about switching lenses. And many times the folks with the smallest cameras who are always kind of apologetic about taking pictures get some of the best shots. And, and I could say that happens almost every trip. So I encourage everyone, if you're interested, just learn one or two tricks, one or two tips in our sessions and go apply them and then just have fun, be in the moment, and observe. So actually speaking about lenses, we've had so many questions about the best uh, lenses to shoot long range, to shoot short range, lots of individuals asking specifically if a 50 to 200 millimeter lens is good enough. Can you speak to uh, the general lens uh, question? A lot of people have really heavy ones. They're concerned about bringing them or how feasible it is to switch them um, as they're shooting um, <laughs> on the landing craft. So I know that this is a lot all in one, but uh, quite a few questions about the lenses. Yeah, and that was a question, the lens, you know, what should I bring for this landing? Do I need to carry my long lens? And there's really no one good answer for that because it depends. there's so many different situations. And my pat answer is, yeah, you should have the arsenal ready. Um, and, and so a lot of the, the more serious photographers, they even have two camera bodies so they don't have to change lenses. But not everyone wants to go that way. Um, so one way to get around that is to stay in that super zoom uh, realm of camera where you don't have to change lenses and you know we're talking about the cameras that have the 20x, the 30x, the 40x telephotos um, from Canon, Nikon, Fuji, they, they all have these ranges they're about five hundred dollars, they're called super zooms and they basically zoom from 28 millimeters almost out to 600 and some go beyond that so for a wildlife trip I mean there are disadvantages to those cameras but for the for the more casual shooter or someone thinking about they want to carry all that weight, those cameras are great. And I wish I could just get by with one of those because I'd be very happy. But that said, if you're if you have bigger cameras now, ones that can change lenses, and that's usually where this 
question comes from, like the Galapagos. You want one wide angle lens, a 24 to 105, and you want then a, a telephoto zoom, so a 70 to 300 or a 70 to 200 or a 100 to 400, somewhere in that range um, that you can hand hold, that you're happy carrying or you have it on your monopod. That would be the perfect, perfect system, either the 24 to 105 plus 70 to 300 or one of those other combinations. Um, and that's good enough for, for most, most of our trips. Um, sure, there's the situations where the polar bears never come close and they're out at 500 and 800 millimeter range and you're still not going to get uh, close-ups of them, but no one, even folks lugging around the long lenses, if the wildlife is far away, are going to get, yes, they will get closer pictures, but um, they're not getting the full frame shots. Those are the rare shots when animals get very close, and and we we get the you know in the different destinations, of course, penguins you can, you know, be five feet from them. Um, so you, it's not about lugging around that big gear, um, but there are situations where you do have to change lenses. So, 24 to 105, a 70 to 300, or the 100 to 400, and you're good on most of our our voyages. Excellent. Thank you so much, Ralph. This has been incredibly helpful, and I know it's definitely answered a, a bunch of questions for individuals here. Um, this is all the time that we have this evening. So once again, big thank you to Ralph Lee Hopkins, our uh, presenter this evening, and thank you all for joining us. And remember, this webinar will be posted uh, in the next 24 hours, and you'll receive an email uh, should you want to review it, should you have come in late, um, and once again, if there's questions, feel free to uh, call and speak to an expedition specialist. Our 1-800 number is up on the screen now. So hope to see you all soon on one of our expeditions. Thank you very much, and good night.